Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your weekly update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim, and today we will talk about supporting African-American-owned businesses and the people who lead them as the country continues to emerge from the pandemic. The economic crisis needs to be overcome. This is one way to do it. Our guests today are John Harmon, President and CEO of the African-American Chamber of Commerce of New Jersey. Larry Ivory, President and CEO of the Illinois State Black Chamber of Commerce and Chairman of the National Black Chamber of Commerce. And Jay King, President and CEO of the California Black Chamber of Commerce. So thank you all for coming. This is, this is just, it's just wonderful to be able to talk about this very, very important, critical aspect of the American business picture. And uh, just to sort of set you up, uh, the National Black Business Month starts in a week. So we want to look at the state of black owned, uh, the black owned economy. Uh, African Americans represent roughly 12.5% of the population, but out of the 32.5 million businesses, just 6.25, so half of the population percentage are owned by African Americans. So you're all dedicated to changing that. So could you just talk a little bit from the New Jersey perspective of the state of the economy for uh, African American and black, uh, black owned businesses? Well, thank you for the opportunity to be a part of today's discussion. And as we all know, um, the black community and the United States as a whole coming out of this COVID-19 situation has experienced a, a se severe degree of turbulence. But, you know, when America has the cold, the black community has uh, pneumonia. And um, so we are every day fighting to kind of reestablish our relevance and our value proposition from a business perspective. It, when you look at the history of the United States, um, black people help establish this country. The irony is, you know, we have 1.2 black re uh, re uh, residents in the state of New Jersey in terms of percentage about similar to what it is in the United States, 13, 14%. And we, we do struggle here. High, the highest poverty, the highest unemployment. Our net worth is about $5,900 compared to whites, about 315,000 in the state. But what we've been able to do through our chamber is forged relationships with those who have the resources, opportunities, and information. With the state government at the highest level, corporations across uh, uh, various industries, the government agencies, and then small businesses. And as a result, we have positioned Black businesses in, in this state to do great things. So we're encouraged. Our financial service community has responded in a great way as strategic partners. So access to capital is a little more readily available. We still struggle uh, with the public sector because of the trades. Um, New Jersey is a large union state. However, with the private sector, we're doing fairly well. So one of the real interesting issues, if you take a look at the history of these types of organizations, there were uh, Irish organizations, Italian organizations, Jewish organizations, uh, various Asian organizations, African-American organizations. Part of this is about trying to break down barriers that are systematically built in by uh, people uh, from the past mm -hmm. right, that affect people today. So uh, Larry, as you look at your work uh, in Illinois, um, how are you helping um, African-American owned businesses to break through either um, uh, uh, barriers uh, to break through in terms of, of having the skills and the connections, the banking relationships. How do you, what kind of programs do you offer to help um, uh, African American owned businesses thrive? Well, we have a number of programs, but I, I'd like to kind of state the mission of the national and the state Black Chamber of Commerce is to economically empower and sustain the African American community through entrepreneurship and capitalistic activities via interaction uh, throughout the Black diaspora. I mean, that's- so you're, you're shamelessly capitalistic. A absolutely, no problem at all with that. Uh, we live in one of the great, 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 great countries of the world. I heard a comment that says, uh, it said quickly is that uh, they were over in uh, South, Af South Africa and they said, Yankee, go home. He said, but take me with you, <laughs> okay? <laughs> 
uh, the, the, the point I make here is that the programs that we have uh, as a organization uh, has been designed to take a look at some of the inherent challenges, capital access, uh, the world of banking is going to change, technology uh, and those businesses who are embracing technology and pivoting, uh, they're going to do better. We're going to have a strong focus on the national level as well as on the state level and throughout all our chambers to get our businesses to embrace technology. We have technology, but the unfortunate thing about technology, we have it, but we're underutilizing uh, these great assets that we have. So our job is to talk to our businesses and to make sure that we give them a lifeline because before the pandemic, they were struggling. When the pandemic hit, it was devastating. So we got to get back on our feet and we got to do the things that we need to do. And I'll just simply say this is that racism is expensive. It's bad for America. You know, this more perfect union can't be perfect unless we challenge it to be better. And it can't be better unless we include people. So we were intentionally left out, created a habit of being left out and then created a culture of exclusion. The only way to fix that is to have, get in a habit of being included. Uh, and then you'll create a culture of inclusion. So we're always focused on policy and issues of policy because a lot of times the, the issue is about policy. And those policies that prevent small business owners, especially black business owners from participating in state and government and private sectors contracts. So every day we get up, we serve black businesses uh, to help strengthen it. And we know we strengthen black businesses, we strengthen black communities, we strengthen black family, and we strengthen America all at the same time. You know, um, I, a, um, uh, in my day job, I, I, I run executive search work and I run an executive search firm. And we did a, a search for the Reginald Lewis Museum over in uh, Baltimore, uh, African-American um, uh, Culture and History Museum. And he wrote a book, said, why should white guys have all the fun? He's also the, you know, the first African-American leader of a Fortune 500 uh, company, billionaire and so on and so forth, really built an amazing business. So, uh, Jay, um, you're also, you get on board with the capitalistic sensibility that, uh, and the shameless capitalistic sensibility that, that, uh, that Larry uh, um, was, was promoting. Um, how, how do you, in, in California, it's a huge state, right? And, and it's a state with real historic uh, issues, just as all of our states do in terms of uh, the relationship of the state to uh, African-American um, business owners, to African-American leaders. Uh, how do you look at, at serving the entire state? It's, it, it's so huge and there's so many different regions with different regional issues. Well, we have 30 different chamber partners around the state. Right. So, um, and so we do that through our partnerships. And, you know, you have to, when it comes to capitalism, this is a capitalistic country, you have to be shameless or you're going to be poor. And, you know, and we've been conditioned in the idea of working 30 years and retiring and living off a pension. And in the 1900s, that worked. We're not in the 1900s anymore. In California, we make up 6.6% .6 of the population. There's only 2.3 million African-Americans in the whole state of California, but we spend $96 billion a year in the state of California, 96 billion. Um, when you look at the issue in our country as it relates to African-American, Black folk, whatever you want to call us, Bilalians, the issue is, even among our leadership, we've done a poor job when it comes to building infrastructure just within our leadership. You look at our communities, I don't care what state you go to, you, our communities have, got, have done worse from 70 years or from 50 years ago to today, we're worse off today than we were 50 years ago. Um, we have not made the crucial move into investing and, um, and speculation. We make up less than 1% of individual investors on the stock market. Financial literacy to me is our greatest enemy. When we become financially literate, I believe we'll change a hundred years in 10. Um, had had we been invested in simple things like uh, speculation coins, like the Dogecoin, for every hundred dollars you put into the Dogecoin, uh, when it was a third of a penny a year ago, 
you'd have made somewhere between twenty and thirty thousand dollars for every hundred dollars you put in. So we have to start, and, and then the, the market itself. You know, um, there, there are stocks out there. Neo NIO was a electric vehicle stock that was a year and a half ago trading for a dollar sixty. Today trades for forty five bucks. So, you know, I have the fin- the Greater Sacramento Financial Literacy Group. Even though we're called the Greater Sacramento Financial Literacy Group, people from all over the country are part of our group. We um we invested pre IPO in Reviver, which is a digital license plates company. Right now, we're investing in the new Tavis Smiley radio station KBLA, um, fifteen eighty, which is a fifty thousand water out of Los Angeles. As a group, we've invested. As individuals, we invest. I believe that we have to plug into the whole of America. And part of that is as investors. So if small business folk were investors, when the pandemic hit and the market fell, they their portfolio would have grew by somewhere between 800 and 2000% because Boeing dropped down to 90 bucks. This is a $390 a share stock. And you could have bought all of the airlines at at a 50, 60, 70% discount. And and then it all came back in a matter of a few months. So, so the, your, point, your point is basically that we've got a, a whole range of different issues in order that we have to connect some dots here. There's an educational piece. Absolutely. It's educational about uh, being a business owner. I think, right. uh, John, you were, you were talking about the whole idea of equipping business owners to thrive, mm-hmm. right? So we have the education of being a business owner, education as, as an investor, education in working with the financial uh, mm-hmm. sector. But as you go beyond education, and Jay's point about education is so uh, important, uh, and you get into action, um, how do you uh, help um, your constituents move from education to action? How do you provide material support, John? Because you have limited resources as well. How do you take limited resources and make sure that every dollar counts that you well, spend? Well, first, let's let's pick up on Jay's point. You know, um, ed- education is the cornerstone of the transformation, right? But Jay talked about capitalism. I use this example. Resources and opportunities travel on this axis. Black people are traveling on this axis. The chamber is the intersection. If you're not connected to where the action is, you're going to be marginalized every day. Um, Within that um, cohort, if you will, are relationships. So you, you have to establish relationships and you can't demonize capitalism and free enterprise because that's where the transformation takes place. So what we do specifically um, we get with legislators to make sure that policy makes sense. We led the effort to establish a bonding and technical assistance program for black businesses, because if you don't have a bond, you can't participate on public contracts over 200,000. Right, so if I'm, if I'm African-American or yeah. any business, and I don't have a bond, right? I might have the capability, I might have the people, I might have the competence, right. but and, and the, the problem with government contracts is they, they sometimes won't even tell you why you get rejected. There you go. So as a result of that, we got the legislation passed, got a Republican governor, Christie, to sign it into law, passed unanimously. And in a, in a year and a half, we've done about 30 million in bonds. Wow. That's a game changer for, for many Black businesses. We have an ex-offender entrepreneurship program and workforce right. program. So the people that are on the bottom or been marginalized still have talent, right? But they need the, the, the prerequisites and the entree to access opportunities to get in a better place. So that's what we do in part, not only an advocate, we have convener opportunities, we connect you to the resource opportunities and information. We challenge policy in the state to make sure that it's accessible to our constituents because we don't want to be um, uh, identified as those who are on, on entitlement programs. We want to fish and grow and, and take and be self-sufficient. And Larry, do you have uh, such examples in Illinois? And then you have a purview across the nation. 
Um, do you see examples of that type of intersection of practicality and advocacy that re results in changes that uh, also cross political, political uh, barriers? Oh, absolutely. I think one of the greatest, uh, you know, thinking that we've always said from a chamber perspective is that the ideology that we are tied to anything, tied to a Democratic Party or Republican Party, doesn't take us where we need to get to. I think the whole philosophy has to be that we got to be tied to policy, not party, but policy. Are the policy good for us or bad for us? If it's bad for us, whether you're Republican or Democrat, we'll be against it. If it's good for us, whether you're Democrat or Republican, we can be for it. You're and singing my song. <laughs> make everybody compete for your interests. That's, that's, that's being smart. That's the evolution of Black political thinking that's going to take us and make America uh, a better country for everybody. But we have to begin to do something slightly different. And Sanity is doing the same thing in the same way, expecting a different outcome. We need to make America um, better, but it's going to be better by having everybody participate. No different if you have an employees, you want all your employees being as effective and, uh, and getting the job done as possible, because that's going to affect your bottom line. That's going to affect shareholders equity, and it's going to drive your stock up. It's going to make you more attractive. Same thing with America. If we do these things, if we remove the barriers, if we focus on the things that really give us a return on investment. And one of the things I'd say, and it's important to say again, is that you know, we can't a lot right now, corporate America is investing a lot in social service organization. That's good and we should. But what we have to be careful of is that you can give a man a fish, you feed him for the day. If we teach a man to fish, you feed him for a lifetime. When you invest in black business and give them an opportunity to participate, you are changing the culture. You're making the biggest impact and the return on investment for the country is far greater. And, and we just believe that's important. And we can't, every day we get up, we're fighting for black businesses. We're looking at the things that barriers, whether it be construction with the Federal Highway Administration uh, is funded through a, a motor fuel tax and all those things. But when you take a look at our participation, the numbers are down. So I think we got a big fight. I got to thank you guys for putting together this forum because it allows us a chance to talk to a broader audience about how important it is for us to work together to build a stronger country, but it can't be built without having true, honest conversation about fairness, equity, and how do we make it stronger and better. I love your point that politics should be about people and not people about politics or political parties, right? I mean, really, who cares about the, the political parties other than as a way to actually get stuff done in this country? And I feel like we've had a lot of disinvestment over the last decades. We need to invest in ways that make the country stronger for the long term. Uh, because we have a we have a long way to go. Um, we just asked a very interesting poll. We asked uh, how many people care about the ethnicity of a business owner, and uh, sixty percent said uh, yes, they care, and forty percent said no, they don't care. Um, and somebody uh, gave a a tremendous tremendous uh, uh, response, which was basically that um, they care because they value diversity. Uh, Jay, as as you look at at uh, at how California works, and, and you look at the various regions in California, you know, you have the East Bay region where there's a, a real concentration of, of black owned businesses um, that uh, around Fresno, certainly LA and different parts of LA, you've got kind of a heat map of where uh, uh, black owned businesses are. How do you ensure that uh, in working with your various partners that the requirements of a region, whether it's agricultural requirements, in, in the agricultural regions of California, the inner city requirements of an Oakland or, or uh, parts of LA, how do you ensure that, that each of those uh, uh, chambers are interacting in a way that does what John was talking about in terms of ensuring that California's policies are advantaging uh, all businesses in the way they need to be helped? Well, that's where the presidents come in, in each of those regions. That's the beauty in a big state like California. One out of every eight Americans live in California. There's 40 million people in California. is 320 million Americans in the United States. So one out of every eight Americans live in um, California. Um, so from a state chair, I can't do anything except be a, uh, a voice uh, a resource, uh, um, an 
um, an advocate for my for my chambers and their and their bodies. And so I'm right here in the state capitol. So as it relates, and, and Larry and John both talked about policy, you know, and legislation. So I'm right here. I have a lobbyist that's on the hill every day. So we're involved in the different languages that take place in different bills and 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 different um, legislation that's that's being proposed. Those presidents of those chambers, it's their it's their duty to make sure that the connectivity between the state, <coughs> that particular city or that particular region, is in place. We um we sent we talk to our chambers every week. We I have an outreach guy, Sam Kinsey Jr., young man. And we send out and we do a monthly newsletter. Uh, for instance, we had a young lady, Hawkins Burgers, in Watts, California. They, um, they've been there since 1939, five generations, African-Americans, come from Arkansas. A father a, a grandfather built this business. And as L.A. started to develop, they built this freeway, 105. Well, they try to include eminent donate domain on his property of all the people that were there. He's the only person that didn't move. He said, I will leave here in a pine box. So when you go to watch California, you see the one Oh five freeway and there's nothing there except for this one business. Well, Caltrans just recently um, sent them a notice saying that they were going to have to tear down their building because they're going to sell this piece of property that's adjacent to theirs and their property encroaches on 500, square feet and they were going to have to tear down their building so people try to make it a race issue but it was really a policy issue within caltrans and a small business issue so because i'm the state chamber president the the local chambers didn't have the reach but i'm right here in the in the capital i could speak directly to the director of caltrans and in a phone call we corrected what could have been a horrible issue and a and a bad a bad look for Caltrans and for the state of California that an African American business that's five generations deep that continues to help the community it was about to be you know ran over by the second largest agency in the state of California. It's such an important point. We're doing uh, some search work for uh, OCII in San Francisco. So that's the redevelopment of uh, Bayview's Hunter's Point. Absolutely. I'm uh, primarily an African-American community uh, that has been uh, dispossessed, disrespected over the decades. And one of the things that we're doing is we're listening to uh, people who have transgenerationally been here talk about uh, what has happened in the past and how we can prevent and also repair to the extent that it's possible. It will never be possible to fully repair, but recognizing injustice and then it, uh, giving a, a, a uh, real attempt to address that is, is so important. And those kinds of issues that you described, Jay, they just cascade through uh, communities uh, built on, on years and years of historic uh, injustice. Um, one of the things that we we are uh, asking right now in a poll is, um, have you uh, have you purposely supported African American owned businesses or workers during the pandemic through your purchasing behavior? And we're finding about uh, two thirds uh, say no, not specifically, and one third says says yes. What can we all do? And in particular, what can other businesses do? who are partners to African-American businesses, because we, we all are, as consumers, partners. In many respects, sometimes in a business-business relationship, there are partnerships. What can we all do to ensure that we all thrive? Uh, John, you want to give a, uh, give a cut at this, because, I mean, I'm obviously not Black. I patronize Black businesses, right? I'm a customer. I benefit from Black businesses that thrive. What do I do, John? I, I want to finish the other point I made, and I'll get right to your question. I mentioned uh, the gov Republican governor supported us, and then the new Democratic governor comes in, and we have a strong relationship with him. He actually funded the program. We continue to build relationships. But to your point is that we have to take and address perceptions head on. 
and be able to articulate the value proposition. I think in Jay's example, it's access in order to do effective advocacy on behalf of your constituents. So as the president here in New Jersey, I coalesce relationships with corporate CEOs, with the governor, with legislators to, to present to them that, to Larry's point, diversity inclusion is a value proposition. And, and but we have to acknowledge that before we can get you know, the disparity, we have to acknowledge it up front, but our representation on behalf of those businesses is key to forging the relationships to advance a more ecosystem that's inclusive. And that's what we do to get at, to get at the heart of your question. We're all in this together. We're all either Americans, New Jerseyans, Illinoisans, Californians, all trying to make this, our state, our country more competitive through inclusion. So that's, that's the point, right? What I can do is recognize that your thriving makes me thrive, right? Absolutely. Your advantage makes me, and I have a stake in your prosperity, right, Larry? Absolutely, yes. absolutely. Um, we're, you know, if, if the economy tanks, all of us uh, get hurt by it. So, you know, it's just good business and just a real basic principle of being a good human being, a good Christian or a good Muslim is to be helpful to your fellow, you know, our legacy is what will we do to make the world a better place because we were here? And people want to know, and I leave this comment that says, people want to, it's not who you know, if they say it's, it, it's not what you know, it's who you know. But I say, that's not it, it's, it's who knows you. And then the question is, what makes you worth knowing? What do you do that people ought to come to your business that you do so well that people want to come see you because you add value? And today is all about how we add value. The value of Black people in the Olympics and everything else that we do has been outstanding. We have to understand that America is stronger when everybody else is stronger. And they haven't done right by Black people in this country. They need to take an honest look, forgive themselves, and we need to get on with the business of becoming uh, maintaining our position globally and even getting better and become the light that sits on the hill that everybody says they got it right. And the Russia don't get it right. Only place they has it right is that we have it right. But we can't do that in some ideology and not tackle the real truth and the real problem of the lack of participation when they benefited at the height of slavery. Four million Black people work for free. Gave them a global competitive advantage. There is work to be done. We can do it. And I trust America to be a better place for all of us. Do you want white consumers and you want black consumers and I want black consumers and Latin Hispanic consumers and I want Asian consumers and I want, uh, right, Larry? I mean, that's that's really what it is. It's like we're, we're going, hey, we America, we have to strengthen each other, right? I mean, we have an investment in each other, don't we? We yeah. do. Our, our kids, we're... we're we're going to leave this country to them and it's going to be a better place for them or a worse place. So we care about our kids. We ought to care about doing something right now to make it stronger and better. And Jay, part of this is dialogue, right? You have a, you have radio programs that, that you continue the, uh, you, your version of dialogue on part of it is just talking to each other, right? Sharing knowledge, sharing knowledge, but also, um, you know, as Larry said, you know, th there's a debt that's owed to Americans of African descent post-slavery. I don't even include slavery, post-slavery, when I'm supposed to be equal with the same equal inalienable rights as every other American. And um, I was segregated. My dollar circulated in my community up to 100 times. The closest dollar to the black dollar was the Jewish dollar. It circulated in its community up to 40 times. But nobody knows that. When my community started doing well, they had these folks called night riders that were made up of lawyers and doctors and mayors and sheriffs and folk that are part of our government that came and burned down our townships, destroyed our businesses. Just imagine if the Rockefellers and the Kennedys and the DuPonts and the Vanderbilts, if their, if their land was taken from them, what kind of value would they have now? And in 1910, 8 million African Americans collectively owned 15 million acres in these United States. Mm -hmm. In 2021, 43 million African Americans collectively own 1.2 million acres. 90, 
8% of our land stolen from us, even by the Bureau of Land Management, was put in place to protect it. So we have to pay that debt. Um, um, I believe every African-American man, woman, and child should, should receive a one-time payment between $350 and a half million dollars, uh, no taxes uh, for five years, any old debt that's 18 months old or older uh, goes away, 25% down payment on a home, uh, free, um, free uh, uh, education. These are things that we have to do because you can't pay the debt that you owe if you total it all up. But what you can do is you can do different things that enable us to be um, to make America great for once. And the only way America is going to be great is when it pays its debt that it owes to original Americans so that we can have the great country that we speak about. Another great topic. We are going to do a future uh, program on the, the question of reparations. How do we uh, deal with historic injustice in the United States? But in the meantime, I want to thank you all for uh, helping us to understand a little bit more about African-American Chamber of Commerce uh, and, and some of the issues. John Harmon, President and CEO of the African-American Chamber of Commerce of New Jersey. Larry Ivory, President and CEO of the Illinois uh, Black, uh, State uh, Black Chamber of Commerce and Chairman of the National Black Chamber of Commerce. And Jay King, President and CEO of the California Black Chamber of Commerce. Thank you so much thank for you. sharing your insights with us. We're so very grateful. Have a great day. Everyone stay safe. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Take care. Bye-bye.